Hello, and welcome back to a Guided Video Podcast. For this episode, I had a chance to sit down with Matt Doobie from Mead & Hunt, an architecture firm focused on aviation. It was a great conversation ranging from Matt's background and love of aviation architecture to the important connection airport has to its community. We also talked about such topics as trends in the aviation market and how people need to feel comfortable while traveling. It was a great conversation, and I hope you enjoy this episode. We're excited to have you here today, Matt. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share the things I'm passionate about. Yeah, this, I think this is going to be great. You know, you, full disclosure, Matt and I have worked together on a few different projects over the last few years. I just want to start off and get some background on you. So, you know, I'm 35 years into uh, working as an architect. Um, I always knew I wanted to be an architect. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. Our family was very, very close to the National Airport. And so on Friday nights, my dad would pile us all up with a picnic basket and uh, in our old station wagon, and we would watch the planes land. <laughs> now, honestly, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I found out years later, it's just we didn't have any money for, for a, a big family <laughs> night out. But I was absolutely transfixed by these people that were coming and going. And to me, they all represented a story that I wanted to find out what was driving them, you know, from their different international clothes, their busy schedules. It just, it captured me. Interesting. So early on, you knew you wanted to marry architecture and aviation together, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, my dad was always building around the house. He was an uh, an, an accountant, and Hmm. most of my friends always thought he was an architect because he was constantly building. Hmm. Um, So I knew I wanted to build, but then at a very young age, I was probably like eight or nine, and my dad said, hey, could you help me out and go to the the landfill? And I said, "Why, why would I want to do that? And so he said, come on, I need the help. So went to this local landfill. And again, I was stunned by all the really good stuff that was being thrown away. So when I mix that and building, and then I always wanted to be around the transportation world, it just felt like a a nice um, mix for me for a career path. I can sympathize with the the landfill portion of that. It's just, there's something intriguing about kind of like found objects and either whether you know the history behind it or you start inventing the history behind it. It just makes it give this personal touch. Like for example, when we renovated our office, we cut an elevator in and the building is 100 plus 120 years old. So I said, save all the raft, all the joists that you're cutting out. Look at me like, why would we save these? I'm like, just, just trust me, save them. So we got them, we had to clean them up. We brushed uh, their old, you know, old pine. Um, and we brushed off the, the soft grain to, re, to re raise the hard grain and even brushing them, you know, they're 130 years old, smelled like Christmas trees in the shop. And then we redid the front of the bar with it, um, here at the office. And it's just, it just adds this nice personal touch when people are like, oh, that looks so great. And it's like, oh, well it came from this. And it just kind of connects the building, you know, to what, what's a, now a new renovation in a 130 year old building. Well, you know, buildings can, can tell stories and, there are embodied stories in every material that's reused. And it's much like having your, your venerable grandfather sitting in the corner, you know, you can, can leverage these. And, and to me, that, that's that standing on the shoulders of the previous generations, that that's really important for buildings to show that. And finally, we've come to a time where we're starting to look at captured carbon or embodied carbon and, and just the sustainable impact of, of, Um, buildings and climate change. And so I think we're at a very, very unique and important time to take advantage of that. I want to come back to that. But before we do that, can you give us a little background on Mean Hunt? Absolutely. So Mean Hunt's been around for over over 110 years. We're uh, an engineering, architecture, and planning company. One of our first big, big projects was uh, being the engineer of record for the Hoover Dam. Uh, there's just a lot of good, we were in heavy into waterworks, hydrology, that type of things. Um, and a lot of times the architecture resulted from the accompanying buildings. We've gotten heavily into um, historic preservation and then just building related sciences as well, almost forensics. Um, but about, I'll say 50 years ago or so, Um, We got our first big airport job in Madison, Wisconsin, and there's still a client today, and we have just grown that across the country. 
And I started about 13 years ago. I had spent the previous eight years hiring Mead and Hunt as an engineering consultant for projects I was on. And I just loved the, the client focus and the there was just something to me that just resonated. My goal then, and it still is today, just is continue to, to build a best-in-class, unique portfolio of, of regional um, airports that mm-hmm. really connect environmentally and socially. Mm-hmm. So you're saying being client-focused. Um, I know you and I have talked a little bit about that in the past. Can you kind of expand on what you mean by that? I mean, architects historically have been their own worst enemies. You know, we we have shot ourselves in the foot for over a hundred years on being making some really poor business decisions, but also letting things, uh, thinking that design only would be a driver for future success. And so we we turned our back on sustainability and the the impacts of building, but also we just didn't understand client needs. We didn't put them first and foremost. Um, you know, I always say that every building is driven by the um, people, place, and planet. And if the people, the program is not satisfied and the client doesn't embrace it, A, you don't get repeat business, but two, it's a building that's easily dismissed down the road. And you want a, you want a flexible building that will have a very loose fit, but a very long life, because especially in aviation, the program changes all the time and you just need to have a building that's ready to react to that. What do you mean by the programming changes all the time? So let's just take the last 20 years. We've had three significant disruptors in aviation. I mean, this profession will put white hair on your head. Um, and the, and the thing is too, is that, so 9-11 came through and everyone said, stop. And then there was this massive regulatory a uh, paradigm shift in terms of TSA and, and security stuff. Um, and then you had in 2008, 2009, you had the, the Great Recession. And so all of a sudden, the financial backing for a lot of buildings and projects, and then also discretionary and business travel, uh, basically cratered. And so we had to be able to deal with that and keep our clients well positioned or being ready when we came out of this recession. And then obviously the uh, COVID related pandemic issues. This has been this has been a year like no other. I mean, we will talk about this to our grandkids about how we stayed afloat, how we recognized it. You know, just that, that's what I think Meet and Hunt has always been great at is positioning our clients for what's next. Yeah. And it's been interesting. I think you and I have shared this before where it's since like the 70s or 80s, how the aviation kind of industry, it's almost like on a 10-year track, experiences some kind of major disruption. The benefit is every 10, you know, it, you get, you'd have disruption, but it always kind of crests back higher than it was before. And it's kind of going up and up and up. Um, and it's really been really interesting by clock, like clockwork. You know, some of the other markets we serve, like uh, academic libraries and public libraries, they, you know, they've had kind of revolutions going on for the last 20 or 30 years. But I've never seen anything like clockwork in the aviation market where, to speak to your point, you're kind of having to deal and almost kind of can predict some kind of major change is going to happen every 10 years. And, and in some respects, it's healthy because you have to reinvent or at least to refresh what your goals are and what your visions are. And, 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 you know, what we're going to see in the not too distant future is again, it's another challenge to um, the marketplace in terms of, because I firmly believe that there's almost no more critical uh, role that aviation plays is connecting the world. And, and so from a cultural standpoint and from an economic standpoint to have that hand in glove relationship that's connected through transportation is critical. But with the climate change pieces, and you've got some things on the horizon, on the short-term horizon, flight shaming and some other pieces, Mm -hmm. we are going to have to justify and recognize the the place that aviation um, takes in this, in climate change, in in the global initiative, but also just making sure that it's a defensible act. Yeah, it's. I think it's challenging because, you know, while the transportation side is kind of so beneficial, I think from a societal standpoint, being able to let people experience other people, other cultures, 
you know, it always blows my mind that I can be in Chicago and then three hours I can be on the West Coast. And then from Chicago in eight hours, I can be in a completely foreign country. In 14 hours, I can be halfway around the world. I mean, it's pretty amazing how kind of transformative that 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 can be to a global society. But it's challenging because, you know, planes, they're not the most energy efficient way of moving moving people. So yeah, it's it's a real kind of uh, from a sustainability standpoint, really kind of kind of yin and yang that kind of plays off of each other. Yeah, I mean, years ago when I started in this, I, I wrestled with that the same thing because I've marveled at it. I have traveled my entire life and I always felt that that was one of the greatest gifts that we had was the ability to travel and, and just see different cultures and things like that. But it always felt like there, there has to be uh, strings attached to this and it is the environmental impact. And so, um, you know, early on, I decided that I need to try to help in areas that I could. And the first one was in the buildings, you know, as an architect, yeah. you separate the airports from the airlines and then the airports, you just work you, the, you, as best you can. You know, they say that 60 some percent of uh, worldwide carbon emissions come from building products and building projects. And so I have spent my entire career trying to lower that impact. Now, there was a ton of news just this week about, um, you know, the one percenters or the three percenters of the traveling public are accounting for this just massive carbon footprint. And these are people flying private jets and, and such as that. I'm hopeful that the um, carbon tax initiatives that we see initially in Europe will migrate here. Um, but also we're going to see, I mean, the marketplace will force planes to have better fuel from an environmental standpoint, whether it's hydrogen, it's biofuels based, or, they, or it's a, it's electric. I mean, there's the marketplace will make this happen. Yeah, it's been interesting. It, well, as you know, I have a bit of a background in aviation, so I, I kind of keep up with with the industry, not only from the furniture side, but from uh, just an aviation side as well. It's been interesting to see how rapidly some of that kind of energy options are kind of being explored and how quickly that's happening, you know, especially around electric. I remember listening to somebody a few years ago saying, it's, you know, electricity is great, but Jet fuel is really energy dense and it makes it really great, <laughs> you know, as a fuel. But within a matter of few years, like how how far that's kind of come. So I, I yeah, I can see what you're saying that there's just going to be a reckoning. One from a, just an environmental and a cost kind of standpoint, it's just not going to make sense. I mean, it's it's interesting to see how fast electric cars are kind of becoming more mainstream. You know, five years ago, you know, ten years ago, Tesla's like, what's a, what's Tesla? And now it's you know, who doesn't have a platform for electric car. So it'd be interesting to see how, how quickly that trickles into a market like aviation, which has been in the past very slow, slow to change. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think I'm glad you brought up the, the car industry because it's mind boggling how quick they've embraced it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm old enough to remember when they, when, when I first rented the, my electric car out in California. And then the next time I went there, they were all taken off the lot. And then I never could find out what happened. And then you found out who killed the electric car. I mean, that, there was that whole bit behind it. Yeah. But now, I mean, you can't go a week without a major car manufacturer saying, we're going to be 100% electric by blah. And then California saying 2030, or Washington said the same. So, I mean, these are uh, transformative moments. And I am I'm very hopeful that the aviation industry will soon catch up to this. Yeah. So, you know, let's just stay on the sustainability topic then. What would, what kind of advice or guidance would you give to, you know, airports that are thinking about new projects from a kind of a building and architectural kind of sustainable perspective? And, you know, sometimes I, I guess I call myself a closeted environmental nut. But I struggle because there's things that are like low hanging fruit that are really easy to take advantage. And then there's very complex, like very impactful, but yet extremely complex things to do. I guess what would be you know, a few recommendations you would give? I mean, the, the first thing is that airports truly are the face of their community. And so if they really want to show the impact that they are making financially and environmentally, have a environmental disclosure statement around your airport. You know, how much waste are you producing? How much compost? Um, 
what are the all the metrics that go into your day-to-day operations? And then the next thing is just start doing an energy model. Do it of your existing building and do it of your of your proposed new building and finding out how certain design strategies uh, really affect your long-term energy needs. And so, you know, we always talk about this phrase called total cost of ownership. And the, the, the lowest cost in, in reality is the cost for the designer and for the actual construction of a building. It's operating it for the next 25 years and paying staff and maintenance costs and all those. Those are the true costs. So if you can wrap your brain around that and, mm-hmm. de- and force your designers to make design selections for materials that are not only healthy, they're easy to maintain, and they have an extremely long life. It's interesting the way you kind of phrase that. It's, that's um, I worked with an environmental uh, company at my previous job, and uh, the person that was there kind of really put it well. He's like, you know, sustainability is kind of made up of three elements. You've got your environmental, you know, component, but you also have society and economics, and those three have to really balance out. And I, I, I kind of like the way that you put it. It's you know, starting off well. You know, it's from a society standpoint, you know, your local airport, what are you doing? How does it work in the community? What are you doing with the community? And then, yeah, obviously there, there's an environmental standpoint, but then total cost of ownership, you know, the economics has to kind of play in. I think that's the challenge too. And it seems like we're turning a corner that, you know, sustainability used to be kind of, you know, an expense burden. And I'm kind of excited to see now that it seems like we're turning that corner, that it's not, it's becoming maybe expense neutral. My dream would be that it's like, well, you know, it's an expense benefit that, look, it's just, we're better off just doing this. And it's not only going to be help us expense wise, but it's going to help the environment and the planet and the society around us. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so many renewables that uh, are ideal for airport projects. Airports Mm -hmm. have a lot of land historically. Mm -hmm. Um, Like we're working, we were just selected for the new concourse in uh, Key West. There is an opportunity for a Southern facing uh, roof mounted solar array and I mean, for for some level of investment, we can pick up 100% of their electrical needs for this concourse long into the future. And so when you start looking at it that way, and then you also couch it against, uh, I have a bit of a history in historic preservation. And I went to see this, the um, president, Richard Moe, speak years ago. And he got up and said, hey, you know, the, the greenest building that we can ever do is the one we don't build. You know, as an architect, I thought that was anathema to what we we talked about. And then I thought, God, he is so right. Let's just continue to renovate, make energy efficient decisions on keeping intact our infrastructure and then do infill development around that. And I thought, God, we can we can actually do this. And so airports can do the same thing because they historically have pretty good bones, uh, but just the program changes within it. And so we can get the envelope to a certain level of energy efficiency, but then being able to put people through in a way that they're comfortable and they'll, they'll dwell and they, um, and actually don't, and don't get sick either. Um, So I think all those things are going to make airports just so well positioned for the future. Yeah. So speaking of that, like we talked about aviation seems to be that industry like clockwork every 10 years, you know, you're going to get some kind of disruption. So as you're thinking about a project or working on a project, what, I guess, what advice would you give, whether it's a major renovation or new construction to folks for like maybe one, two, three top things to think about when they're, you know, saying, hey, we're going to do a major renovation. What should we be thinking about for the future, knowing that we're going to probably see some kind of disruption in 10 years and down the road? Well, I mean, the first one I'll touch on is pandemic related because everyone... Mm -hmm just trying to understand how to wrap our arms around this. And we're just, sure. luckily we're coming out the back end of it and with the vaccination rollout and, and, mm-hmm. and all that. Um, and, you know, for the longest time, the FAA got very, very nervous and almost put a halt on all projects because they didn't understand what would happen from a future forecasting, how, how it would impact public spaces, but just what where the industry was heading. And I think now they're easing out of that as well. And so there's a lot of people that came and said, we need to have a hundred percent touch-free environment. And I think we've talked about this long into the, you know, we, we've always embraced that in restrooms and other areas and at security checkpoints. 
So I think the new kings that you're going to see from a pandemic influence are going to be technology-based solutions for biometrics, uh, how to get your stuff from your curb to your airplane door with minimal exchange of hands. Um, and that goes all the way to concessions, um, pre-ordering, those type of things. Um, and then the other one is just um, the mechanical engineers are going to be the next new heroes in the next five years because air filtration systems are going to fundamentally change. They're just going to be the air exchange rates and fresh air exchange is going to be so much more. So, but, you know, five years from now, this won't be the focus. And I think, again, the focus is going to have to be keeping healthy buildings. Sure. That are easy to maintain, but also easy to use. I mean, if, if people feel stressors, mm. mm-hmm. and they will, they will um, pay with their pocketbook and they will say, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and right now we're seeing, you know, again, pandemic related, the business traveler hasn't returned yet. And so there's a corporate attitude right now. They're trying to figure out what is the new normal, but the discretionary, the, the um, traveler that's out just on their own time and for uh, vacations and things like that, they are coming back at an amazing rate. But their expectations are, you better get me there safely. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We talk about how passengers feel and that, you know, feeling of comfort in the space. You know, I've been asked, and I'm sure I'll ask you this too, it's, you know, what are we designing differently now that we're in a COVID world? And what I found fascinating, because I've had a lot of time to reflect on this, obviously, is, you know, what are we doing differently? And I found is that we're not really actually making that many changes. I think what's, what I'm noticing is that society and people and human behavior has always demanded something, you know, a certain level of comfort, certain level of distance from other people, certain level of, you know, kind of experience, you know, being specific in a terminal space. And we've kind of ignored it for a long time in the sense of, you know, from a furniture perspective, it was always just how many seats can we fit in to a space? Because we just assume everybody wants to sit down and everybody's going to sit down all at one time or whatever. So just cram as many butts in as possible, you know, and now it's really understanding, well, people don't really want to sit on top of each other. And if you just throw kind of seats, you know, just a quantity of seats, it's not going to make people feel really comfortable before they get on what could be a stressful trip. I mean, Travel, you know, now that I have two kids, you know, the stress level <laughs> has gone up as, <laughs> as we travel. So I found is that it's, we're, you know, it's less about the changes that we're making for COVID and it's more about embracing and understanding what people need to feel comfortable. Are you seeing, is you seeing that from kind of the architectural perspective as well? Yeah. You know, we were, we were getting all these indicators kind of reflected back to us from the public over the past 10 to 15 years. You know, you, you're spot on when you said in the original hold rooms, they used to just line up. It was the old Herman Miller seat and they would line them up as far as the eye could see. You know, every image you ever saw of aviation just showed that people lined up. Um, honestly, you know, we, we have the Midwestern effect too, where people don't want to sit next to each other or sometimes they don't you know, not everybody is the same body size. So the not one size fits all works. And so what, and when I'm in an airport, I tr- I like to stand. And so um, when we started talking years ago about, well, what are our options, you know? So first we tried a soft seating area in, um, and then we said, God, that really works. People resonate in that. And then we said, well, how about, is there any way we can do a business carol? And we had a couple of those. And then we quickly went away from the hidden business carol because people love to understand and see things around them. So then we said, well, you know, I personally, I want to stand at something with my laptop. So then the power table came out. So now, I mean, honestly, three years ago, people would still like the traditional layout would be cramming in all these seats because you know we're required to have a certain amount of seats per the aircraft served at that gate. But, but now, I mean, I couldn't even imagine trying to do a one-size-fits-all solution, and people don't need it. And But also, there's a demographic shift there. So there's two types of traveler, for the most part. 
There's a younger person that is more in tune with technology. And so they'll say to me, why do you bother to put uh, a single monitor on the wall? I won't look at it. I want everything pushed to my device. And that's the only thing I look at. And then you also see uh, some ambulatory challenged aging demographic that have time and money, but they still want an almost concierge experience. So they want someone to just give them a little hand, you know, uh, without relying on technology. And so those are the two things that we are really trying to cater to, but also spacing out everything post secure once they're through security. We're really working hard to get people to dispel the notion of a gate hugger where they feel they need to be by their gate. And, and I think that people are really, really reacting well to that. And then we're going to see scheduled boardings and scheduled checkpoint screenings. Um, I think that, that will help to disperse crowds. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think that's the, that's always the, the challenge of, you know, and I think that's what makes people feel comfortable, you know, in our designing for human behavior webinar, we talked about, we talked about the, the space, you know, we have the bubble that's around us. And, you know, I always give the example of like the more public space we are, the bigger that bubble grows, you know, and I'm sure in a, in a pandemic world, I, you know, I've seen that bubble grow and I'm sure that bubble will shrink in the coming years, but it still shrinks to a certain size. And so, yeah, it's an interesting challenge once you get, again, like you're saying, people post security, how to, you know, how do you control that flow separation of people? Because I think that's really where the comfort and the variety, like you talk about, you know, we had Bill Browning on for our last webinar and, you know, he, you know, he's really big into biophilia and we use the two points of biophilia a lot in our design as prospect and refuge and really get that variety of furniture kind of comes into play with that, you know, getting someone up high, like the power tables gives them that you know, some people that comfort because they can survey the environment. Some people like the the huddle area. So how do we kind of create that environment where now people can kind of huddle and, you know, get that kind of refuge or that cave fort kind of feeling as well. It's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Yeah. I mean, I love that you, that you bring up biophilia because it truly, I mean, if we're finally having the neuroscience documentation about mm-hmm. abuse to nature, all these things that are just they're enhancing our, our, our life experience and they're making us healthier and, and de-stressing. Um, and, and one thing that I just absolutely love about your industry is that, so when I lived in Seattle, I had a handful of aha moments that were, I didn't even know how I stumbled upon them. The first one was we were looking at just preservative treatment and I didn't understand what, how it all worked. And then I found out a lot of it was arsenic based for preservative treatment. And then you started, and I thought, well, how, who in the world would do this if they're making childhood play equipment? What happens if your kid puts your mouth on it? Which, if you have kids, they do. And so, you know, I was just so happy when that changed. And then the urea formaldehyde piece for plywood, you know, the adhesives market. And so I just think it's so great that the furniture industries and, and Agati right at the forefront is understanding that um, these things matter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's again, I, you know, it seems like what's what's interesting. And I think the obviously pandemic is a driver of this. We're, we're definitely at a few different inflection points. And it's been exciting to see, you know, from, you know, like you're saying, from a neural uh, health science perspective uh, and environmental perspective, understanding like how our relationship is to the outside world, nature, it's kind of, it seems like it's really culminating. And I guess one positive thing coming out of the pandemic is it feels like it's accelerated a lot of trends. Uh, Some maybe not good, but, you know, in this instance, I think, you know, some trends that are, I think are really positive for us. And it's, you know, I'm glad to kind of see we can maybe take advantage of that. Yeah, we, uh, we, we had a round table a couple of weeks ago for a, a virtual conference one of the the presenters on there was just again talking about the value or the the importance of maximizing retail revenue and you know i took the counter to that and said well i don't feel that the passenger experience ultimately is driven solely by consumerism it's more about a comfortable um processing because they're going to be traveling And bricks and mortar retail has probably seen it's, uh, we're going to have a radical change in in that marketplace. But to me, it felt like more that the wellness of the space was more important because I personally, 
I would love a place that had a, um, a healthy food uh, and drink option, but with potential for an exterior patio, um, for seeing, having access to natural materials. And then with obviously with good Wi-Fi. So when you mix all that together, there's no better place. The, the new marketplace is at airports because seemingly, I mean, we're all shutting our offices down, you know, we're talking about it. And so that's why I think they're, they're more germane in the future than ever. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I wanted to hear from you. What are your maybe one, two, or three top projects and, and why? I mean, top projects that I'm working on now? <laughs> uh, I think just throughout the issue, what have been your maybe favorite projects? All right. So we just finished the design and we're bidding right now for phase one of Glacier Park International Airport. Mm. Um, I was born in Montana. My family lives there. I have a certain emotional tie to Montana, the state, but also to the national parks. And so when we won that project, I I was just elated because we, we went up against massive international firms. But I really made an impassioned plea for that connection to the national parks as America's greatest idea. And so really pushing that idea of um, craftsmanship and exposure to natural materials and local craftsmen being uh, uh, visible in their art. And so that one is great. And my the biggest crazy takeaway is that right now during bidding, we are being asked to analyze the marketplace, why some products are more expensive or not and how the pandemic impacted those materials. And so it's been great. I spent the last month uh, just studying materials, calling manufacturing centers, understanding raw product versus assembled. And so that, that, that's my number one. Um, second one is, you know, we just won the, I mentioned the um, Key West International and the sharp point of the spear of climate change is right, is right there. And so I want to make sure everything we do moving forward is informed decisions that will help them long into the future. Mm, mm -hmm. But understanding, you know, airports take on different roles nowadays, too. They're almost emergency operations centers. Mm, There's mm -hmm. eight zones. They are congregation. They're the, 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 the big public space of the future. And so I want to make sure that I do that, do that right. It's interesting about uh, Glacier National Park. My wife and I were trying to go to all the national parks at some point in our life. It's our bucket list. Um, they keep adding more, so it's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's making it harder and harder. You know, so obviously we travel around to uh, all these different airports, and mm-hmm. I love the regional size level because personally, there's no greater impact that you can have in your community than a an airport a local airport that reflects the cultural landscape, but also um, just making sure the economics are there long into the future and to not leverage them financially. So I take such uh, pride, but also I care in making sure that they're going to be, it's going to be right for them. But there are a lot of um, people that go in and will study uh, a region for an hour and a half on on Wikipedia or something and feel that, that they get it. And so they will apply a thematic pastiche. You know, they'll just like put a, a wall covering of something they think is regional. And I can tell you most locals absolutely hate that. So my family called me, my brother called when we first started at Glacier and he said, do not make this look stupid. <laughs> You know, he, he, he even got it, and that's not his industry. <laughs> Some great encouragements for, from your brother. <laughs> <laughs> we could start wrapping it up today. I really appreciate the time. There's a lot of really great insights, especially in the aviation market. In closing, I just wanted to, you know, we've been asking people, especially with everything going on, I wanted to get any words of wisdom you may have for people as we go kind of into the future here. You know, this has been a year of of reflection and introspection, and you know, a ton of us have been isolated to our basements, and and you know, we we quickly found out you know the importance of IT in our world, 
Um, and, and, you know, what is the, the true value of, of client connections? Um, so from, from my industry perspective, I would just say, take a breath, understand your client needs, please recognize the climate impact of everything you do and then embrace it because uh, this will make our industry stronger. And I honestly feel that the public is screaming for us to make a pleasant travel experience because people are, you can tell people are just so ready to embrace some level of a new norm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great words of wisdom. Well, Matt, I really appreciate the time today. This was, this was great. Joe, I appreciate it. These are always fun. And uh, I just want to thank uh, Agati as well for doing such a great job in the marketplace. 